tools in skilled hands can be as powerful as weapons. During the 17th century, the first combat engineers emerged, using explosives to breach massive fortress walls. Today, as rapid deployments of troops becomes increasingly important, engineers often hold the key to victory. They clear the attack routes, so valuable to offensive operations, and construct obstacles that can ensure a safe retreat. This ability to control movement on the battlefield makes the combat engineer indispensable to an army at war. The Gulf War was yet another reminder of the engineer's vital role. The 72nd Combat Engineer Company was attached to my task force uh, for the duration of the war. And uh, they were so important that I had my two lead companies forward, a tank company and a mech company with 113s. Immediately behind that was me, with my tactical command post, and my engineers. And the reason they were with me forward is because as soon as we ran into enemy obstacles, and we did in the valley, they immediately kick in and breach the obstacles so that we can maintain our momentum in the attack. And we became big believers in their capabilities. As troops and equipment arrived in Saudi Arabia, training took on an added sense of urgency. Intelligence and reconnaissance reports indicated the Iraqis had constructed a series of fixed, dug-in defensive positions along the border between Kuwait and Saudi Arabia. U.S. exercises began to resemble a desert version of World War I, where soldiers learned how to penetrate defensive engineering obstacles, such as trenches and barbed wire. However, the technology employed in Desert Storm was certainly not World War I vintage. Engineers quickly constructed airstrips as coalition forces began to control the battle of movement before the ground war had even begun. Amazingly accurate, smart munitions knocked out Iraqi bridges and other strategic positions. But as the start of the ground war approached, most of the Iraqi positions were still intact. A decision had to be made, to attack the defenses head on or attempt to maneuver around them. In the end, the coalition forces made a wide sweeping maneuver around a lot of these defenses. However, some of those defenses had to be breached. They had to be cleared. And that is why the combat engineers had a very vital role in punching through those Kuwaiti defenses. First of all, the mines had to be detected. Then they had to be cleared. The main method of clearing the fields were mine plows attached to engineering vehicles and other armored units. These plows dig up mines from underneath the surface, avoiding the detonators on top of the mines. The use of armored vehicles like the Ace Earth Mover allowed the forces to quickly move forward, even in the face of possible enemy fire. The mine clearing line charge is another method for clearing fields. It fires a hose filled with plastic explosives which is then detonated, destroying any mines in the area. Engineers kept the ground forces rolling along, and soon they had moved deep into enemy territory. We hit uh, two berms in the Euphrates River Valley that were not on any of the maps that we had. It was a big surprise. It initially delayed uh, us being able to continue to push forward, but uh, the 72nd engineers kicked out with their aces and they had them breached in a matter of minutes. Absolutely incredible. So we could continue the attack. The next series of obstacles were the trenches and bunkers constructed by the Iraqis, where the heavy fighting was supposed to take place. They were pretty much beat when we, you know, when we got there with the bombing and everything, but they, they put up a struggle and for a little while, and then they just kind of started surrendering. And, but as far as their defenses, the way they were dug in, they were dug in deep, real deep. The way they were set up, they would have probably taken out a lot of us. The bunkers were set up, I mean, with furniture, uh, TVs, uh, food, just enough, enough shelter, enough equipment to actually stay down there, I guess, for about uh, 30 days or more. The Iraqi strongholds were soon deserted and engineers found themselves concentrating on earth moving and the laying of concertino barbed wire 
in order to construct POW camps. Air engineers and infantry we build them. And out in the opening in the sand, we use concertina all the way around, maybe 100 foot by 100 foot, and we put as many POWs in it as we could. The engineers still had one final task to accomplish. They pretty much let us run loose um, on all the equipment that the Iraqis had in an attempt to destroy all their war machine and basically just did demolition missions using the infantry and armor as security and blew up everything that came in our path. Combat engineers had once again proved their value during conflict. Engineers are, are an essential part of the combined arms team. We consider ourselves warriors. We're out there in front. But when it comes to getting the task force through an obstacle, it's our mission to get them through. And we expected to take casualties out there in those minefields and, and obstacle systems. We were lucky. We were extremely lucky. We didn't take any casualties. Desert Storm was the most recent demonstration of a time-honored military tradition. The combat engineering history in America began as the nation itself was fighting for independence. And as the country grew, engineers helped to open the West. They also assisted in the building of the Panama Canal, which created a strategic new route for trade and military transport. But soon the skills of American engineers would be tested on the battlefield in the first great war. Revolutionary developments such as the train and the automobile were to make World War I the first of the modern wars where the ability to keep troops and supplies moving quickly became an increasingly important task. German engineers built the railroad lines, roads and bridges which allowed their army to sweep into Belgium. There, improved artillery firepower demolished the fortifications which were supposed to halt such aggression. While new developments in civil engineering aided the construction of fortifications, other developments were being made which were going to aid in their destruction. The development of high explosives and the introduction of cordite to propel shells to even greater range foredoomed the great concrete and steel fortifications of the turn of the century. The German army moved into France and it appeared as if the First World War might be won with a single massive push but the French army was able to blunt the German offensive as swift advances by cavalry units became a thing of the past and trenches came to dominate the landscape. The huge armies of 1914, the three million strong French army, the five million strong German army, were able to create instant fortifications with the use of pick and shovel. Initially, quite shallow trenches, but as the armies remained static, these trenches were improved ever deeper. Sandbags were used to further reinforce them. Parallel trenches were dug. Eventually, these systems became several miles in depth. Communication trenches were dug to link the various lines of trenches, so a soldier need not expose himself by going over the top to deliver supplies to the forward trenches or when a normal relief in the line took place. To protect the forward line of trenches, forests of barbed wire sprang up. Soon, the no-man's land between the front lines of the two opposing armies was dominated by the barbed wire. An infantryman forced to go over the top would have to make his way through the barbed wire across an open plain swept by machine gun fire. Trenches, barbed wire, fortified machine gun nests. These defensive engineering measures virtually eliminated movement from the battlefield. But military strategists still insisted on massive frontal assaults by the infantry to take ground from the enemy. Soon there was a shortage of soldiers on both sides. Reinforcements were sorely needed, and fortunately the Allies had a great untapped source in America. The French and English were under the impression that we had a large military. And little did they know how few we really had. They asked first for engineers. Could you send us some army engineers? We knew nothing about trenches. We knew nothing about building trenches. 
we had to learn trench warfare, trench technique, British technique. And uh, so that's how the American engineers were trained was in actual combat. American engineers joined with French and British veterans to introduce several innovations. Bricks and concrete were used to reinforce field bunkers and trenches. A clearly defined firing step was added so troops could fire while standing and then step down out of harm's way instead of balancing on an unsteady slope. Trench sides were reinforced and ladders or earthen steps meant that soldiers no longer needed to waste valuable seconds scrambling out of trenches. Despite these improvements, a trench was not exactly a comfortable place to live. We had to stay in the trenches for some periods of time, and uh, which we didn't like. There are no words to explain how difficult it is to constantly be in mud. But believe it or not, it has its moments of great relief and security and in the off hand <laughs> sort of explanation, I guess you might call it, it was a haven. The German army was also forced to spend long periods of time in the trenches under equally inhospitable conditions, including the bitter cold on the Russian frontier. But any man would prefer a trench to the meager shelter of a shell hole. Still, nothing compared to the horrors of going over the top and through no man's land. It's no way that you could explain a firefight or being flat out scared to death going over the top. The wire was wicked. The German wire was so bad, so tough to get through. So many of our men got hung up in it, just got all shot to pieces. Uh, after a big push, it was pitiful to look back at the American bodies that would be there maybe for a day or two before we could get them untangled from the wire. Finally, there came an invention which could overcome all of the defensive engineering measures and provide desperately needed offense for the Allies. It was a British Royal Engineer, Colonel Swinton, who conceived the idea of the land ship, the tank, an armored vehicle which would be capable of rumbling forward, crushing barbed wire, impervious to machine gun fire, crossing a first trench and moving on to cross the second and the third trench. The Americans quickly moved ahead. Engineers laid wooden pontoon bridges, allowing the infantry to continue the attack while vehicles crossed over more permanent structures. The last German defenses were penetrated and the prisoners were led away. The American Corps of Engineers could now celebrate knowing that it had paved the way to victory. After World War I, American military planners realized that mobility would play an important part in any future conflicts. Therefore, in 1919, the Army set out on a coast-to-coast -coast convoy to prove they could keep both man and machine moving over great distances. Engineers played a vital role, even filling in ruts made by covered wagons, and soon the convoy had reached its goal in San Francisco. Germany built a long defensive line in the wilderness near the French border called the Siegfried Line, but she also saw mobility as a key to future victories and began to develop a fast-striking mechanized force. France, on the other hand, assumed a defensive posture and concentrated solely on fixed fortifications 
to repel any German attacks. Between 1930 and 1936, under the direction of French military engineers, the Maginot Line was created, a huge concrete and steel fortification which stretched along the French border with Germany. The world would not have to wait long to see which strategy would prevail as Hitler continued to build his war machine while signing treaties he had no intention of keeping. I had another talk with the German Chancellor, Herr Hitler. And here is the paper which bears his name upon it as well as mine. World War II began as a classic battle of offense versus defense. The fast-moving German Blitzkrieg avoided the Maginot Line entirely attacking through Belgium instead. This highly mobile strategy exploited the shortcomings of fixed fortifications. The tremendous disadvantage is that you're immobilized. And what happened, the, the attacking force simply would bypass the, the main facilities, get around behind them, and then either close in and destroy them, or else just leave them there. So once, once you've passed it, uh, its, its real value is, is negated. Soon the German army had taken Paris, and once they had control of the northern half of the country, they began to fortify its coastline to deter any attacks from across the channel. This length of obstacles and concrete bunkers became known as the Atlantic Wall. In order to take the offensive, the Allies began planning the invasion of German-occupied northern France. Increasingly large amounts of American troops and supplies made their way to the southern coast of England. The problem was finding a suitable place to attack where the Allies could gain a working harbor. All of the German ports were heavily defended. The Allies decided capturing an existing harbor would be too costly, so they decided to bring one with them. Engineers built a floating harbor, which was taken across the English Channel in sections and assembled on the shore near Normandy. Soon ships were docking and vehicles began rolling off this amazing feat of engineering. Not far away, the main attack was already taking place, where combat engineers were close behind the infantry. There was a, a tremendous number of engineers because they had found in previous uh, uh, invasions that without to support people, the engineers to clear the beaches of the obstacles and then to help unload, they simply couldn't uh, make an invasion work. Once the beaches were made passable, the heavy bunkers of the Atlantic Wall still needed to be penetrated. The Germans uh, set up small arms fire and uh, heavy uh, uh, artillery and direct uh, tank, anti-tank fire. Now, these were housed in very heavy, well-protected, well-guarded concrete emplacements, pillboxes. Most of those things had to be taken and they were taken by infantry and engineer coordinated attacks. The line was very difficult, and we lost a considerable number of men of 15, 20,000. Indeed, the cost was high, but the Allies finally had their foothold in France, and it was time to take the offensive. As the forces moved forward, engineers were immediately called upon to solve a problem indigenous to the Normandy region of France, thick hedgerows, which the tanks could not get over or through. In Normandy, we had these hedgerows, which were absolutely awesome defense positions. And it was a young engineer sergeant, I believe, that came with this idea. And he'd had experience of clearing hedges on a farm with a bulldozer. So this soldier came with the idea of this hedge chopper, 
which was nothing but a piece of I-beam with some long spikes welded out in front. And you take those spikes and hook them onto the towing clevers on the tank, and they were about 18 inches long, and the tank would run up and hit the hedge, and those spikes would dig into the roots of the hedge and cut the roots, and the inertia of the tank would go through, and it worked beautifully. The next series of obstacles to be conquered by the engineers were the many rivers that flow through Europe. If you take a look at the map of Europe, you will see that Europe is crossed by uh, no less than about eight major rivers. Virtually any bridge of any consequence, the German blew them as they retreated, so that the river was there as an obstacle. You could say that the tanks, for instance, or the infantry could have made the advances across Europe without engineers, but they would have suffered substantial delays and they would have suffered probably more casualties. Pontoon bridges had improved since World War I. They were now made of rubber instead of wood and could handle almost any vehicle, including some of the heaviest tanks. But even these newer pontoon bridges could not be used when the rivers were flowing quickly after heavy rains. There were other recent bridging advances which also helped the Allies sustain their momentum. Portable steel bridges held fast in flooded rivers better than the pontoon bridges. The Scissors Bridge was a folding bridge section affixed to a tank chassis, otherwise known as the Armored Vehicle Launched Bridge. It helped protect engineers from enemy fire while quickly bridging smaller gaps. But probably the most effective method for spanning rivers of any size was the Bailey Bridge. Each component of the Bailey Bridge weighed less than 600 pounds, allowing engineers to quickly move it into place. Effective and fast bridging was essential to keeping everyone from the Buck Private to General Patton moving forward. But constructing bridges was dangerous work. First, engineers had to cross the river in small boats to make sure the landing site was suitable. And once building had started, they were often under direct enemy fire. Once across, the German minefields were usually the next threat encountered. Because the German army was now on the defensive, they relied more heavily on the use of mines in order to slow the Allies' advance. Large anti-tank mines designed to stop Allied armor were usually used in combination with anti-personnel mines. To prevent engineers from lifting the anti-tank mine, anti-personnel mines had been developed. The purpose of the anti-personnel mine was not to kill, but to maim to impose a burden upon the enemy's logistics system. Wounded men needed to be evacuated. To counter this gruesome threat and to keep the forces moving forward, the Allies developed several methods for clearing mines. The most reliable method was to clear the area by hand while on the ground to avoid enemy fire. The engineer used a bayonet to probe the ground. Once something metallic was encountered, the engineer would find where the edges were and carefully dig the mine up. Generally, uh, we sent uh, teams in there. You usually worked in pairs, and, and uh, you wanted to know who you were working with pretty well. And most of the time, we tried not to leave any pair in more than about 30 minutes because it, it really you get pretty nervous, and, and, they, and they had a hard time doing it. When the area was not covered by German fire, metal detecting minesweepers could be used. This method was quicker than clearing by hand. Therefore, the sweepers were mostly used on roads where they could help keep the armor units on the attack. As the war progressed, other more creative mine clearing systems were developed. One used compressed air to blow away recently dug up dirt, thereby revealing the edges of the mine. It was quite effective, but not readily available to most units. Another method was known as the flail tank. To provide the engineers with some protection, specialist armored vehicles were developed. 
One such device was the flail tank, which had a boom in front of the tank and a rotating drum with chains attached. The chains would spin in front of the tank, detonating the mines and clearing a safe lane, the width of one tank. But as Allied mine breaching methods became more efficient, the Germans countered with more ingenious mines. Early metal mines were comparatively easy to detect by the mechanical methods then employed by the Allies. The Germans developed the plastic and indeed wooden mines, which were far more difficult to detect and hence more deadly. The most common of the wooden mines was a small anti-personnel device known as a shoe mine, containing a half-pound explosive charge, a detonator, and a fuse. Because of its small size, it could be hidden in a variety of places and was still capable of taking off a foot when stepped on. Besides mines, the Allies always had to be on the lookout for German booby traps, which could be placed virtually anywhere. But no matter what the obstacle, the engineers had to keep the troops moving forward, and that meant keeping the roads open. Mud was often more of an enemy than the Germans, leaving the engineers to pull the trucks and tanks out with their recovery vehicles. During the winter, ice and snow had to be conquered. And when the elements weren't wreaking havoc, the Germans were, leaving rubble from destroyed buildings or roadblocks in the way. But the engineers fought through it all and kept the forces moving towards Germany. In the Pacific theater of World War II, the naval engineers were also getting the job done. U.S. strategy in the Pacific was one of island hopping, capturing Japanese-held islands, which would then be converted into airstrips for American bombers. The job of converting these islands into airstrips fell to the U.S. naval engineers, the Seabees. Before the airstrips could be built, the islands had to be captured. Just getting the vehicles through the soft sand and volcanic ash was a challenge. But the sea beads came through. And after some very tough battles, the Japanese were rooted out of their bunkers and caves. The roads and airstrips could now be built as the U.S. gained another valuable stepping stone towards Japan. Allied engineers on all fronts were winning the vital battle of movement. The only major obstacle left was the German Siegfried defensive line. There was little resistance as the engineers breached this final barrier. Soon the forces were pouring through, and as the U.S. Army neared its ultimate goal, the other units had a chance to reflect on the remarkable abilities of the engineers. They had to fight, you might say, unprotected from enemy fire coming in at them. They were unsung heroes and respected. They knew when they had a job to do up, in fr up at the front. And they, they performed very well. Arenas which had once held huge Nazi demonstrations were now deserted. And the engineers chose to end World War II with one final and very appropriate demolition. Despite German superiority in mine technology, Allied engineers had won the battle of movement during World War II. Across Europe, the roads had been cleared and the rivers bridged all the way to the outskirts of Berlin. In the Pacific, the tough Japanese island defenses had been penetrated and vital airstrips had been constructed. But only a few years after these challenges had been overcome, an entirely new set of obstacles appeared in a small mountainous peninsula known as Korea. From the beginning, American forces found themselves on the retreat. Unlike World War II, the engineers concentrated on defensive measures to slow the Korean and Chinese advance. In many ways, the battles in Korea resembled those on the Western Front in World War I. The United Nations forces developed extensive fortified positions and faced human waves attacks from Korean and Chinese troops. Bridge demolition was crucial to the UN effort, and combat engineers proved they could do the job. 
Once a bridge had been destroyed, artillery would rain down fire on the opposite bank. Even entire harbors could be demolished, forcing the enemy to rebuild as U.S. forces pulled back. Eventually, reinforcements arrived, and American troops went on the offensive with a daring amphibious assault led by General MacArthur. But the red wave just kept coming, and soon, U.S. troops were moving back across the 38th parallel, taking out any bridges that were left along the way. Many of the same soldiers who had kept the Allies on the advance in World War II proved they could provide a solid defense as well. On the decentralized battlefield of Vietnam, engineers had to demonstrate their skills for enhancing friendly movement, while at the same time countering enemy mobility. The first task was often construction of a fire support base where the foliage would be cleared away and the area would be drained if it was wet. Supplies were often brought in by helicopter as engineers began to dig their positions. The former clearing was now being constantly improved. If you're there another day, you fill a few more sandbags. You dig a deeper hole and you keep building up the longer you're there. Spare time is you're filling sandbags and you're making that, that hole into a bunker. During construction, engineers patrol the base perimeters right alongside the infantry. But creating new roads and keeping them clear of mines was one of the most important tasks for the engineer in Vietnam. Roads were a rare and precious commodity in this land of jungles. The more roads there were, the easier it was for troops and armor units to get to where they were needed. But building them among the trees and undergrowth was not easy. In order to prevent flooding, most roads were built a few feet above the surrounding land and drainage ditches were installed underneath. Even on dry roads, the convoys could not move until the engineers had swept for mines. North Vietnamese and Viet Cong forces were highly adept at booby traps and mine warfare. Whereas 20% of U.S. tanks during the Second World War had been destroyed by mines, about 70% of U.S. tanks and armored fighting vehicles were destroyed by mines and booby traps during the Vietnamese War. The reason for the high North Vietnamese success rate is that U.S. forces, when mounted in their vehicles, were channeled along tracks and roads, making an easy target. The Viet Cong would usually attempt to mine the roads at night, but the engineers were often waiting for them with the Claymore directional mine, the weapon of choice for ambush and perimeter defense. When we were going to set up an ambush on a trail, we would use three Claymores, and basically we would do that so the VC, they wouldn't come to the roads at night and plant their mines. But it was tough because you had the civilians there. So you really had to be careful where you put those anti-personnel mines. Usually when mines were found, they were blown in place with explosives to prevent any accidents that might occur from attempting to disarm them. Another method for keeping roads safe was to remove any foliage for a few hundred yards on either side, which effectively eliminated any hiding places the enemy might want to use for an ambush. And once clear, the convoys were free to move ahead safely. But some areas of Vietnam were simply too remote for roads, so engineers would hack their way through to create new footpaths. Making that, that first initial cut into that, into that bush there, it's kind of eerie feeling not knowing exactly where you're going. 
and, and being surrounded by all that foliage and, and thick jungle, I mean, I mean thick jungle, that not knowing which, which was really the edge of, of the daily life over there. Once the paths and roads were operational, the rivers had to be bridged. Pontoon bridges were still in use, while other rivers usually required more permanent structures, but the Armored Vehicle Launched Bridge, or AVLB, was the most effective means of keeping the armor units moving through Vietnam with its many smaller rivers and ravines. Despite the engineers' success in clearing the way for friendly troops, they had a very difficult time trying to control the movement of enemy troops because the enemy was not always in the jungle, but often underneath it instead. The North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong armies constructed vast tunnel works beneath South Vietnam. They were self-contained cities. From within these underground tunnel complexes, Vietnamese forces could pop up to snipe American forces and then disappear at will. The opposition's ability to move effectively underneath the ground is the main reason why there were no clear battle lines in Vietnam. Therefore, a group known as the Tunnel Rats was called upon to take the fight to the enemy. Finding the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong within their tunnel complex was a difficult and dangerous job. Tunnel Rats were American volunteers who went down into the tunnels armed with a flashlight, a pistol, and clawed their way forward in the darkness until they made contact with the enemy. On other occasions, the tunnel entrances were simply blown up with a grenade or explosives. But this was only a temporary measure because it destroyed just one entrance and not the entire tunnel network. The combat engineers performed admirably and kept the ground forces moving. But in Vietnam, the battle of movement was fought to a draw. Today, a new generation of engineering vehicles is allowing combat engineers to accomplish their missions more efficiently than ever. One of these new vehicles is the Combat Engineer Vehicle, the CEV, is designed on an M60 tank chassis and has a 165mm assault gun designed to knock out enemy fortifications. It is a capable earth mover, but one of the CEV's most important and recently developed abilities is to clear mines, which it demonstrated in Desert Storm. The Engineer Research and Development Center at Fort Belvoir, between September and December of 90, developed a, what they call the CEV rake. It can proof the minefield by wind rowing out the whole lane and just shoving out the mines to the side. Uh, that was a great innovation and uh, it was designed in three months, sent out to us and we attacked with it. So that, that has increased the capability of CEV that much, that much more. The M9 Armored Combat Earth Mover is another of today's effective engineering vehicles. It can scoop up dirt as a front-end loader and either dump it out or use the weight of the dirt to make the ace a more effective earth mover. The M9 can quickly dig defensive positions for tanks on the battlefield and is also fully amphibious in all but the fastest rivers. Like the CEV, it too proved its worth in Desert Storm, particularly in breaching Iraqi berms. Still an important tool today, the Armored Vehicle Launched Bridge has served combat engineers well for a number of years. Armored Vehicle Launched Bridge, or AVLB, is, uh, is also on an M60 chassis. It's designed to carry anything in our inventory right now. Uh, you can lay it across wire obstacles, you can lay it across a tank ditch, uh, you can lay it across uh, an anti-personnel mine field uh, if it was absolutely necessary and it will accomplish the mission, it will allow vehicles to pass. But probably the most remarkable looking of the new engineering vehicles is the Counter Obstacle Vehicle, or COV. The COV has never gone into full-scale production, but it represents an important prototype for future engineering vehicles. 
Its most innovative design features are the telescopic arms, which can be operated simultaneously. Interchangeable accessories, such as a grapple, can also be attached to the arms. In addition, the COV incorporates an earth-moving attachment and an effective mine plow. It can tow the mine-clearing line charge, which destroys mines in a 45 by 330 foot area, and once the COV has cleared any remaining mines, it leaves a safely marked path for other vehicles to follow. Mine dispersal systems have also undergone some amazing changes. Artillery rockets and missiles can deploy mines up to 60 miles away, and even aircraft can now deliver mines such as the Gator Mine Dispersing System. The Gator system can be used on any aircraft capable of delivering free-falling munitions, allowing an army to lay movement restricting fields deep in enemy territory. Once in place, they're just as lethal as any hand-placed mine. With more than equipment, it is pride and dedication that ultimately prepares the combat engineer to confront the horrors of battle. We were combat engineers. We were with the frontline troops. I didn't run out and do a Sergeant York. I didn't kill 120 people with my own little rifle. I just did what they told me to do as best I could do it. Out of my platoon, we had, uh, we had three KIAs, uh, three guys that lost limbs, and uh, probably 90% of the platoon got a Purple Heart. The dazzling array of today's engineering technology illustrates an ability to shape the landscape and to channel the direction of combat. The state of these advances raises certain questions. Will advanced earth movers and quickly scatterable landmines create an impassable battlefield like the pre-tank stalemates of World War I? Or will improved bridging systems and mine clearing equipment permit attackers to easily sweep through enemy defenses? In either case, the struggle to control movement on the battlefield rests in the hands of the combat engineers.